Welcome to the Growth Ventures Podcast, the go-to platform for entrepreneurs, innovators, and change makers. I'm your host, Hamlet Dazeri. In this podcast, we delve into the world of business, technology, and innovation. We bring you conversations with industry leaders, disruptors, and visionaries who are shaping the future and making a difference. So whether you're an aspiring entrepreneur, a seasoned business owner, or simply a curious listener, join us on the journey of learning and growth. Welcome to the Growth Ventures Podcast. And now, let's delve into today's episode. Welcome back to the A Growth Ventures Podcast. Today, we're thrilled to have Kareem Abul Naga, founder and CEO of Practice Benefit Corp., with us. Kareem is a true visionary in urban education dedicated to the closing the opportunity gap and empowering the next generation of leaders. In this episode, we'll explore Kareem's journey from overcoming early challenges to becoming a TED Fellow, author, and social entrepreneur. We'll also dive into his mission-driven work at practice, his thoughts on leadership and education, and his vision for the future. Prepare for an inspiring conversation as, the, as we uncover the values, insights, and strategies that drive Kareem's success. Kareem, thank you so much for coming on our podcast today. I'm really excited to have you on. Uh, I, I know there's amazing insights that you're going to bring be bringing in for the listening audience. Of course. The pleasure is all mine. Grateful to be here. Awesome. So Kareem, what we'd like to do is obviously set level stage everything for everybody that's listening in. We're going to start a little bit in like a timeline fashion going from your earlier days to where you are today and talking about all the great things you do. Uh, given that I, you, you've had like an incredible journey, man, you've gone through so, so much. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what, a little bit about your background so people can understand what, you know, where you grew up, what, what kind of education you yourself went through, and then eventually how you got to where you are and, and saw the problem and overall in the market that you're trying to solve. I'll try and condense the 32 years in one or two minutes. So I love that. <laughs> uh, but, but God is good, you know, so I'll, I'll start there. I've been really blessed and fortunate. Uh, my parents were Egyptian immigrants who came to the United States in that typical, like, I want to start a family here and give them a better life. Um, I'm the second oldest of seven. Uh, my well, father. Were you actually, born here or did you, were you born I in was, Egypt? I was born in the United States. So all my siblings are born here. Nice. Um, but my father dropped out of high school in Egypt. My mom only finished high school in Egypt and they came here and uh, education wasn't as big of a priority for us when we were growing up. I remember I had 60 absences when I was in seventh grade. My mom was sort of like, if you don't want to go to school, that's on you. It's your future. And uh, it, it sounds like a great mantra for building independence, but it's horrible to give a 10 or 11 year old choice when it comes to going to school. Yeah, I, I think they'll err towards not going to school. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, unfortunately, my father passed away like right as soon as I turned 15. And by virtue of like being immigrants in a new country, um, we grew up low income. So I went through all of these struggling underfunded public schools. Um, but I was fortunate enough to have a series of nonprofits and mentors who ultimately you know, helped me escape the dead end path that I, I could be on, like so many of my friends who didn't have that guidance and didn't have that support. So I wound up graduating in the top of my class in high school, did my freshman year at a local business school and then transferred to Cornell, where I finished in the top 10 percent of my class. Um, did my internships. When at, did that change for you? I, that's interesting right there, right? Like you went from, you know, going to school occasionally to like starting to take it seriously. When when did that light bulb per se or that importance of school really kick in for you? Yeah. So my father got really, really sick, terminal lymphoma or terminal cancer. And so the thought of being handed something completely disappeared and dissipated. Um, and I remember being in this incentive program that paid kids to pass advanced placement courses. So I was part of this big national experiment that was going on or citywide experiment that was going on at the time. And the executive director was a Puerto Rican male who grew up in the Bronx, um, went to Columbia undergrad and NYU law school. And he was saying education is the way out. And I had nothing else to believe at that point, and I didn't want to be in the situation I was currently in. I wanted more. You know, I heard those stories and those podcasts where people would tell, or not podcasts at the time, maybe like videos where they say where, where you end up um, doesn't have to be where you started, right? And so because I had nothing else to believe in, I just believed that. And I, I went all in on education, and uh, thankfully now, you know, looking back, it, it was the right decision. 
First of all, I, I'm sorry that what happened with your father. Uh, I myself grew up with a, a single mother as well, and uh, I I can see how that influenced your path. And and in a way, you know, I'm I'm sure he's looking down on you, and he's proud and blessed of all the things that you've been able to accomplish. And excited to share that with the listening audience. Um, as you kind of went through this, you know, you started taking education a little bit more seriously. Uh, what were some of the bigger things you were noticing or or at this point you still didn't realize that right there there wasn't necessarily you weren't aware of what you were with the education you were getting at the school system what what it could have been that that revelation hadn't come yet or no you have, you have no idea right you don't know what you're missing until you see what the others have right when you're i was growing up in a system and i felt like everyone around me had something similar or was getting the same thing and I didn't have anything else to compare it to. It wasn't until I got to college and I hear about how much my friends' parents spent on their private school education the entire time and the trips that they were taking and the quality of the facilities and the schools that they went to that I realized that, you know, we may have been gypped, you know, <laughs> or shorted on through our educational experiences. Like when, when our teachers are absent, you know, we were excited. We're running through the hallways, like we're cutting class. Um, we're not thinking about how we're being robbed of our education. You know, it's not till you get to college and you study the disparities that you start to realize like, oh, the reason why I had so many substitute teachers is because there's a teaching shortage. The reason why I was sitting in the auditorium with all these study halls was because they didn't have a teacher who could teach Spanish. Um, the reason why my school day was longer with all of these blanks in it is because they didn't have enough teachers to students. Um, so it wasn't until I got to college and I started to study the inequality that I realized how many kids were being short and not just my own experience, but for so many kids growing up, just coming up right after me. Amazing. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of that, but uh, you also had some incredible internships. I, I'm, I'm guessing at college, right? You ended up working at Goldman Sachs and BlackRock early in your career. Uh, what, tell me a little bit about that and, you know, working at those two major financial institutions, what are some of the things that you learned and, and where did you, at that point, decide, no, this is not the path I want to go. I want to do something more. Yeah, I wish I could tell you I had some like elaborate plan. I didn't know what a BlackRock or a Goldman Sachs was growing up. No one in my neighborhood knew anything about those places. It took my mom years to realize I wasn't working at a retail bank during that time. <laughs> no, this is not <laughs> Saks Fifth Avenue, mom. This is not. <laughs> So I, when you grow up poor, you want to be rich. I mean, at least that was the case in, in my scenario. I'm not saying everyone is in that same way. And I had mentors who were a few years older than me and ahead of me. And they were like, Kareem, you're smart. You're hardworking. Like, go work on Wall Street. Like, you'll make a ton of money there. And so that that's I went down that path, you know, and I really actually enjoyed the work. Um, I'm someone who enjoys like digesting news, looking for patterns, um, being able to synthesize like what I'm seeing and then making predictions and then going back and evaluating those predictions. And I feel like you get to do that in the world of finance. Um, so started at Goldman, had a rotational program there for a summer. The following year went to BlackRock, was in the fixed income portfolio management group. And I started my education company actually as a nonprofit my sophomore year of college. So I thought, one day I'm going to be really wealthy. I'm going to need to do something philanthropically. I really care about the community that I came back from. Here's a perfect like segue. If I start building this now, I have a place to put that money and help other people. Um, so, so, but, practice, so practice started initially as a nonprofit. You know, you weren't sure where you were going to take it. And, and at the same time, you were still an int You started doing internships. You were still trying to figure things out. Is and then I'm a student. You know, yeah. like I'm, I'm 18 years old when I started. I'm not thinking this is my life's work. I really cared about it. I cared about the inequality. I've always been someone who's motivated by social justice and making sure everyone at least has an opportunity. So I was compelled to do something. And I remember one of my first mentors I went to and told I was starting this. And he said, uh, Jay-Z says that you can't help the poor if you're one of them. And one of his mentors told him, like, you can't write a check if you haven't made one. And both of those things were true. I was poor and I hadn't made a check yet, um, but I was at Cornell. And though it, it didn't seem like much, I already had so much more than the kids I was growing up with. Got so it. I, to me, it was a, it was a no brainer. I was going to start something. Hopefully over time, I'll make more money and I'll be able to support and give back that way. 
Um, but I was sitting at BlackRock. I remember my junior year during onboarding or orientation and they're playing the BlackRock founding story. And the entire time I'm sitting there, I'm like thinking about the founding story of practice and what that looks like. And um, by the time I got to the end of the summer, uh, they had, they told us, they were like, there were a hundred interns, there were 10,000 applicants. And then of those hundred, they made offers to 40 of them. And I was one of the 40 lucky enough to get an offer. And I was sitting there and I'm doing the math and I'm like, you know, what is it that they see in me that I don't see in myself yet? And I had a lot of alumni at Cornell who were coming back who would say like, take the risk now. Uh, you have nothing to lose. Um, you're not going to do it later when you have a mortgage, you have a baby, you have a child. And we were just talking about that a little bit earlier. You're just not going to be able to take that kind of risk. And I believed them. And, you know, at the time, it was a really difficult decision. I alienated some of those mentors who felt like this was the path. I should absolutely go and take that money. My family needed it. It was going to make a big difference for them. And I don't, I don't know why I thought this, but at the time, I was like, you know, a $70,000 a year job with benefits and all of those things is not life-changing amount of money. Yes, it's a lot more money than anything I've had, but it's not going to pull my family out of poverty. Like there's this not, just not enough to do that. So will my mom notice the difference if I don't take this job offer and, and I go and take a little bit more risk and do this? Like probably not. So I turned down the offers. Um, I went headstrong into now building this education company, hoping that one day would be growing and in the direction it's in today. That's amazing. And, and I'm sure that was not easy at all, that decision right there. Uh, I think I was on the opposite side of that coin once in my life where you know, I wanted to start the startup and I got the incredible job offer and I, I just couldn't turn it down. I, I had People to try and scare you, man. That's the other piece. You know, they try and scare you and they're like, if you don't take this now, it's gone. And the thing I realized is even after I turned down the offers for months, I still had people calling and offering jobs. And I, I do think this is true. If you're smart and you're really hardworking, there's always going to be a job for you. I love and so that. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like panic. Now, if you're insecure and unsure about your ability and you're, you're always on the fence about the quality of the work you're producing, then yes, take it, you know, the godsend. Um, but if you know you're going to put in the effort, you're willing to put in the hours, you're a quick learner, there will always be a job opportunity for you. So, so it sounds like the internship gave you clarity, right? It, it gave you the focus of that, hey, I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to, I'm ready to plunge. Tell or at least I want to do it. I want to give it a chance. I want to do it. So, and tell me about that. Here you are, you, you know, fresh out of school or just, you know, young, don't don't have the financial <laughs> means. <laughs> and you are about to embark on something that's not easy, right? Tr trying to help reform, uh, provide value to uh, the education system that that is, you know, needs a lot of it but and you probably don't even know how to do this at this stage i'm guessing but to the level naivete, of course if you don't know at this stage yeah you know is a blessing man like the less <laughs> you know sometimes <laughs> but, like, so, if, so, they'll tell you if, if you know what if i knew what i knew today would i have done it I, I don't know you know i would like to think that i would have um but it's painful it's hard and you know the generalizations people make about it all the time like you're going to make a lot of sacrifices um, there's going to be decisions that you're not going that aren't going to sit well or feel good, and you're going to have to push through it. There's going to be bridges that will get burned in the process of you pushing towards your purpose. So, so um, let's let's tell people about what you guys do now. So, and I think they can, and and what did it initially start as, and then what has it changed into? So, from the the very beginning, our focus has always been on Title One, which is the federal designation for low income. Um, it was about closing the achievement and opportunity gaps. So making sure that children who grow up or grew up and were growing up just like me had the same opportunities I was afforded. And which you realized at Cornell, right? When you went, which to I realized at Cornell, it's not a level playing field. I've never been the person who says every single person in the world should be successful. That's just not my motto. Right. I, but I want everyone who is willing to put in the effort and the work to have the same opportunity at achieving that success. That's something that for me has always been like a non-negotiable and, Society's not set up that way. I had friends who worked just as hard who didn't have the same opportunities, who didn't have the same life outcomes. And that's not fair. And that's not right. I think we, we as citizens of, of one of the best nations in the country have a social responsibility to make sure that if someone is willing to work hard, put in the effort, that they should have the opportunity to achieve success.
I mean, so it, it is in theory that fabric the essence of the American dream, right? That that, that most immigrants come to the U.S. that that they know even non-immigrants, people born in poverty, they know they have a chance, an opportunity if they put in the work, if they you know are willing to sacrifice and make the take the calculator risk, they should be given the opportunity to try to succeed. Well, and, and the worst part is we make that promise as a country and we just under deliver on it. So I think that's the other piece. Like it's one thing if we didn't as a company, as a country lead with that as a calling for people to come to America because they could realize that better future, fine. But we actually as a country stand behind that proudly and we just continue to co consistently under deliver on that promise. And so that wasn't right. That compelled me into action um, when you're 18, you think you can change the world. And so I'm there thinking I'm going to change the world. Um, I did all of this research on the achievement gap and the disparities. And so when we're starting out, we started out with summer because the research was showing that kids in low income neighborhoods were forgetting two and a half to three and a half months of what they learned over the summer. Wow. So naturally, you, you're taught things. You don't do anything for the summer. You don't practice them. It's like a foreign language, right? You don't study it. You don't practice it or apply it you actually forget it. So you go to school the following year, having not retained that material, your teachers know that. And instead of teaching you the grade level material for that year, they wind up spending the first two months reteaching you the stuff that you should have maintained over the summer. So now you're four, you're almost four to five months behind, right? Like, like just starting, starting and just starting it, out, you're five months behind already. Well, and remember that that's assuming you got a hundred percent the year before which no one retains 100% of what they learn. I don't care who you are, right? right. You're, most people are B students, average, right? So you're getting 80%, 85% of what you're supposed to learn. Um, and then, then you have the regressions and then you have the wasted time because people know that you didn't retain it. So we talk about an eighth grader having a fourth grade reading level and we're astounded. But really when you think about the amount of time lost in the regressions, it makes logical sense. Right. So I said, we, if we're going to solve this problem, we have to start with summer. I used to think summer school was punishment on purpose, right? The schools were sending bad kids there. They wanted to make them miserable so they'd work harder the next year. And actually what I realized was schools just don't have the time to plan. They're very reactionary all the time. They're understaffed. They're underfunded. They're really just trying to get through the next day. And then all of a sudden summer school rolls around and there's no time to plan or prepare. And so they're rushing and putting everything together in time to, to have something. Um, so most summer school sucks. Um, and that's why kids aren't excited to go to school over the summer. But there's a big need. We saw it during COVID, right? When kids were out of school, parents needed someone there. Um, if you're middle class or affluent, you can travel, you have programs that you can put your children into. But if you're low income, there's nothing for your kids to do all summer. Right. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like comparing what I went through and what my son is going through now. I'm like, and it's like the sheer amount of camps he gets, the the education he gets, and what I what did I get? I got, I got Channel Nine and Channel Eleven to watch cartoons and then go to the park and play basketball. That, that's what. Hey, I, <laughs> but by the way, like you want those things still because they're, they're part of life, right? But but yeah, completely different world than the one that we were growing up in, and not not for any other reason than kids have a right to maintain what they're learning and we're not maximizing our investment this taxpayer dollars at the end of the day we're spending thirty thousand dollars a year to send a kid to school in new york knowing they didn't get a hundred percent of the material then we're respending that same amount of money reteaching them the material they should have had and then they're graduating and they're not ready for career and they're not ready for college so when so, you initially start I, I love where you started you started in summer school so you went totally in an area that you could pr pretty much control and pr add value, immediate add value back. Uh, what I'm guessing one school, right? That it was the initial my, one. And, yeah, my school actually. No, no or, one would give us alumni no of the school that you us. just had. You had just gone to. Uh, I'm guessing at this point, had you figured out how you were going to get paid or this was just, hey, I'm just doing this and I'll figure out that. Um, I mean, I, I ran a triathlon. I started fundraising for my friends at Cornell, just asking people for donations. The initial model was I want to help poor people. And so I thought the only way to do it was through a 501c3. So I need to raise money from rich people and I could do the Robin Hood model and run programming for poor people in the process. And that, that was it. And how do I get them to actually donate? I started running triathlons to inspire them to say like, hey, I'm going to make this sacrifice, add more of to, to what I'm doing to try and do that. And I, 
actually, I took the bulk of my internship money from Goldman Sachs and BlackRock and funded the programs. Wow. So I, I didn't think about it at the time that I was here. I was like putting my own money into it um, because it was a nonprofit. But that's what I did, you know. And again, I, I made ten thousand dollars my sophomore year at Goldman. I, I think that was the same amount of money my mom made that whole year. And then my junior year at BlackRock, they paid me almost twenty five thousand dollars at the time. And that was almost triple what my mom made all year that I was making in 10 weeks. So I don't know. At the time, I was like, this, this is more money than I need, more money than I know what to do with. I was very lucky to have a lot of financial aid and scholarships for college. And so I invested that way. Um, over the last now, this is our 15th year. We've evolved. Amazing. 15 years. That's incredible. 15 years. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a millennial. And they said we couldn't hold a job. So... <laughs> 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 so how many schools are you guys in now? Uh, last Just... school year, 143. Wow. Um, we've we've expanded. Um, we're evidence-based in what we do. So from the very beginning, we've always been driven by the research. Um, there's two areas that I, I tell folks we focus on. One is personalizing instruction. And the other one is extended, extending learning time. So both of those things, so much evidence and data behind it. The more we can individualize instruction, figure out what students need, the better off they're going to be academically. And then the more time students have to learn, whether it's after school, summers, um, the more time they have with instruction, the better off they're going to be academically. So, and then within that, we run a whole host of programs. Last year, we supported just over 61,000 students across the country. Amazing. So, so practice obviously has changed now, right? So practice is no longer a not, non-pro- it's nonprofit. A B, it's a B Corp now, uh, which is unique in itself, right? So... So when did you switch that and decide that, hey, I'm going to go from a non-profit to the B Corp? When did the model completely change so you could scale up and grow grow it to where it has? Come? Yeah, it was between 2015 and 2017 when all those changes happened. I think I, I felt like I was hitting a ceiling. I started to get really jaded with the nonprofit space. I started to read all of these like educational pieces that Stanford was putting out that talked about you know, the the number of nonprofits and for-profits started at the same time, yet the difference in their ability to scale, the, the difference in their ability to, to have impact. I started to also learn a lot about education and education funding. And I, I made this, I made a, my own personal like decision to say, you know, when there's no market, nonprofits make sense. But if right. there's a, if there's a market, then you need to figure out how to solve a need that addresses or that, that can take advantage of that market, you know? So um, there was that, then there was my own like dissatisfaction with the nonprofit model and the nonprofit work. And I felt like I need some, something needed to change. Um, and I hit a critical juncture because I was like, I, if this stays as a nonprofit, I can no longer run it. But all of the research was showing that at, at where my organization was in its life cycle, that if I left, it would, it would die. It would no longer exist. And at the time we were making the conversion, there weren't a lot of models of success. Most organizations actually go from for-profit to nonprofit. You know, they care so much about the mission, but they realize they can't make any money. Let's run this as a nonprofit. Very few at the time, if any, were making the transition from nonprofit to for-profit successfully. So there was no blueprint out there. So we were one of few organizations to be able to make that transition successfully, but the odds were stacked against us. And so I remember thinking, if this stays nonprofit, I'm going to leave and it's going to break. If I convert it, there's a very, very small chance it'll succeed. But if if, it, if I don't change it, I'm not going to stay. So it's going to die anyway. At this time, two, this is five years, six years into it. Is yeah, is it, making, like, is, is it making money at this point, or is it is it just like fluttering? Well, we're from- raising philanthropy, and I like at our. I mean, I raised two and a half million dollars in the two years after I graduated. Wow. Um, which is for someone who didn't grow up with a network, you know, I'm raising money from people I had no business meeting, the Rockefeller family, the Tisch family, um, Bill Ackman, um, incredibly generous people that I'm finding someone who knows someone who can help me get in front of them um, to support the work that we're doing. But the challenging part is I felt like they were always just giving to me instead of giving to the work. Got and it. so I knew if I left, they wouldn't continue supporting the organization. And that didn't make me feel like the work I was doing was going to be sustainable for the communities that I cared about. Understood. And, and so now who, who actually pays you guys? So, so is it 
the school systems? Is it uh, walk me through how the model itself works? Exactly. It's, it's the schools. So for a very long time in the early days, schools would tell me they had no money. And really what it meant was they didn't have any money for what I was doing or <laughs> they didn't have any money for me. <laughs> Not that they didn't have any money. And I think it's a very common like misconception when you're an entrepreneur and you're going out there and what's the first thing someone who doesn't want to buy from you tell you like, oh, I don't have any money. And the truth is they do have money. They just don't have any money for the solution that you're providing. So I started to realize that I learned the ins and outs of procurement. Um, and I started to recognize how to align what we were doing with the goals that the schools needed to achieve. You know, I, I felt like we and nonprofits do this really well. They solve social problems. And for-profits are really good at solving pain points. Um, B Corps, I think, are special because they're in the middle, right? They are working to solve a pain point, so they have a financially sustainable model, but they're doing it with the intention of solving a social problem. Got it. Uh, I mean, so you came to this realization, you did a ton of research, you saw, you saw that there is ways or there's allocation in the budget, then you went through the process of trying to figure out how you would fit and be part of the budget plan. Is this kind of a good summation of the transitionary period or? Yeah, but add, add in like uh, years of frustration with uh, government timelines and payment and all the other heartache and challenges that come with that. Is it easier now or is it still the same? Like you're at this point, you're past the, you know, can you really do this? You're at 130 schools. I don't even know how many schools 143 in, last year. 143. So. How many schools are in all of the U.S.? Is it? Are we talking about thousands, ten thousand, hundred thousand? What's what's the market? Yeah. So you're talking about fifty thousand schools across the U.S. Wow, that's incredible. So, what is the goal? Like, w when will you be happy? Because I, I still see it in your eyes. You're like, man, I, I wish I could be doing more. I, I can I can tell that the <laughs> hunger is still there. So. So how, how do you scale it up? How do you get to 200, 300, 1,000, 2,000 schools? Yeah, I mean, the, the next stage for us is now going after districts. So New York was a very decentralized school system. So you're going school by school in many ways. And um, in the beginning, I hated it. I was like, this is a horrible like business model. And what I didn't know, though, is when you go district by district, when the superintendent turns over, your whole district turns over. So your deal is also gone. When you go school by school, it's less likely that the school leader is going to turn over. You're building longer term relationships. And while it takes a lot longer to build that foundation and, and book of relationships, they're a lot longer lasting. So we did the hard part first in so many ways. And then when you have those relationships, it makes it easier to get into other districts. So, um, I know, so, if, so if a school wanted to work with you guys or wanted some some support from you guys, what's what's the process? Is, is it relatively quick on your end it's just more on their end that it tends it tends to take longer or yeah it depends on the bureaucracy in their school district their school system so right. some schools have their own spending decisions and, and power and others needs to go through like five systems or layers of approval before they can spend a single dollar so um, and and again we don't charge families because we serve low income that's our focus right we want to serve low income kids and families and that's by inherent our own commitment. There's no mandate. There's nothing like that, right? We're a social enterprise, um, but we're structured as a for-profit company. Um, we've just made the commitment to only focus on low income. I've been fortunate. You know, we basically bootstrapped the business when we went for-profit. Um, so there's no outside shareholders. There's no investor pressure. Um, it's me saying and driving the pace. I want us to grow. I want us to serve more children. But the to, to get to your answer, the target right now is a million low-income children served by 2030. So um, that's the next milestone. And when we get there and get really close to it, we'll set the next target. That's amazing. And I'm sure you've been doing this a while now. So some of the students have gone to incredible schools. Have any of them come back and oh, say, I, mean, I want to give back. I want to do what I, what you did for me. Has, oh, man. Has like, yeah, exactly. I mean, we had, we had a child last year, Sophia. She got $280,000 in scholarships. Her mom called us. We've been working with her since she was in elementary school and she can't wait to come back as an education champion and pay it forward. Um, but I think the most gratifying story for me was from um, one of our early mentors in the program the very first summer. Um, she was a student, I'm not gonna share her name for anonymity, but um, she, she flat out said, you know, like I'm afraid of white people in one of our like group circles. 
And one of her friends who was sitting there was white. And she's like, well, I'm white and you're friends with me. And she was like, well, you're different. Um, her mom was a housekeeper. Uh, that girl went on to graduate salutatorian. She went to Brown. Um, then she went to go and work at BlackRock after. So you talk about wow. like a full circle moment. Now she's at Google. Um, but I've had other like scholars go to Cornell, Middlebury, NYU. And, you know, they're many of them go on, they teach. Um, and our teachers now are school leaders. We have coaches who have become principals. Um, so you can talk about the quantitative stuff all you want, but the qualitative stuff is really what keeps me going and gets me excited. That's amazing. Like these stories obviously demonstrate how well the program works and and the impact, the real impact it's having on people's lives. And it, it's just an acknowledgement, Kareem, to everything that you're, you, ha you have built and everyone in your organization is doing and working on. Uh, let, let's now transition a little bit. You're also, which I found amazing, a TED fellow. So, so, so talk to me a little bit about that. You have, is it one of the most inspiring talks in 2017? <laughs> is this true that my team, did my team do this up? I, I wasn't the reporter who put the article together. But, <laughs> I mean, Elon Musk and Tim Ferriss were giving talks the same year, but yeah, it was, it was like one of the, the the nine most inspiring that year out of the conference. Um, and I, I think, you know, in so many ways, it's like the American dream story, right? And and it's the the vulnerability, the authenticity that I lead with and also the the feeling of I'm guessing that the talk was about your your life, your your journey, or can you well, can you share Ted, a little bit of Ted is all about ideas worth spreading. Right? right. So when people come to me and they're like, what should I talk about? What do I do? I'm like, well, what's the idea that you have that's worth spreading? Um, and so for me, I'm sharing a summer school that kids actually want to attend because most of us think summer school sucks. And I'm, I'm doing it through my own like lens and narrative. Um, so revealing and sharing a lot of who I am and what inspired the work and what's driving it. Nice. So, and I think that, like, at what point did you decide that you even wanted to do Ted? Like, and the fact that you were able to do that, at, you, you know, walk me through that. Yeah, I mean, I, I got to a point where I was like, I need to raise awareness about what we're doing. And I think I always like kind of educate and talk to folks. And I kind of say, you know, like if you want to do something, do something really big and do something really important. Um, it's a lot easier to get help that way, because when you do something small, everyone just assumes that you can handle it. Right. Like I said, I want to tackle the achievement gap. Everyone's like, Kareem's smart, he's hardworking, but he's not going to solve that problem. And that's that's the truth. You know, like here I am 15 years in, I don't feel like we've made enough progress. Um, and I've had a lot of support and help from folks along the way. And yes, we've changed lives and we've had an impact, but there's so much, so many other lives that we haven't reached, so many other folks that we haven't helped. Um, so I think that was a big part of it. I put the story out there, continued to reach out, was persistent and had an opportunity um, to be able to do that. It's incredible. You know, you know, the journey of entrepreneurship sometimes can do this to most entrepreneurs is where they will go away from their core mission and they will do a pivot, right? It, it becomes such a famous thing in entrepreneurship. Do a pivot. And I did a pivot and then eventually I, I was able to do something. But it sounds like your pivots have never really swayed away from the core mission. What advice would you give other entrepreneurs on how to continue doing that? What What do you think has led you to be so steadfast in trying to solve this problem over the years? And, and even till today, like I can I can hear your focus and drive on, man, I'm just getting started. 15 years into this, we, we, we're helping a bunch of kids. They're, they're having incredible success stories, but I'm not done. This is just the beginning for me. So, so Walk me through that. What advice would you give some entrepreneurs? I mean, my senior year of college, I was really lucky to take a class with a professor that focused on, it was called career planning in the hospitality, but the title was a mask for discovering your values, your own identity, and being able to be true and authentic to who you are. And I remember going through that class and really just being very clear about what the things were that I valued. And I saw that incongruity when I was getting ready to decide whether or not I was going to take my full-time offers. Um, and, and my number one value in, in my life, and that leads everything I do is making a difference. So 
And it was the one thing that I told myself I would compromise everything in the world for. And my wife hates it when I say that, you know, I compromise my health, I compromise my family, I compromise everything because I feel like we've been put on this earth to serve. Um, and so that guides me. And then beyond that, like having clarity around what your mission is. You know, I, I took a stand. I said the experience I had wasn't a coincidence. When I looked back and looked at who was changing the education system, I saw a lot of people with really good intentions, but not people had actually been through it. And I felt like I had a unique vantage point. Um, and I didn't believe in coincidence. You know, I was convicted that God put me on this earth to do this kind of work, um, that whether or not I enjoyed it, and I have days where I don't enjoy it, but this is what I was put here to do. And I think when you walk with that level of purpose and what you're doing, there's, there's no other option. But I would say, you know, have that clarity around what your mission is. It's very easy to lose focus and you don't know why in the first place. I love that. Uh, so where are you, he where's practice headed? Where do you see it going in the next couple of years, the next five years or so? What are things that if, if you could leap forward in time, what, what, what do you, what, what do you want to accomplish? Where are you, where are you guys taking it? So I, I mentioned the million children supported by 2030, um, we've been building out this great book, Behavior Management. Like It's really a school-based learning management system. And my hope is that we're able to leverage are you guys that. Kind of, you guys are past summer school now, right? You're, we're you're past also... summer school. We're all, we're all year round. Um, we're, we're building software. We run programs for schools during the school day, after school. Yeah, And yes, we're trying to boost achievement and test scores. And you're in-person as well as virtual or predominantly in-person? Uh, in person and virtual, so in person and online, um, and I think COVID forced that pivot, and it was something that wound up being good for us because we had to evolve and we responded to it. Um, but yeah, the, the dream scenario is one day you're getting real time data and you're doing tutoring or you're providing support based on where kids are actually struggling. I think there's a lot of wasted resources right now in the tutoring space because schools and providers don't talk. Schools don't do a great job of always capturing data. There's a lot of data privacy laws. So you really need to be sensitive with it. And there's not good mechanisms for data sharing. Um, but how much more effective would it be if in real time, when a student was struggling in class that day, they got the support that they actually needed? And wow. that's where I think the disconnect is. So I'm hoping you're saying five years, fast forward, we're able to provide almost this like real time or just in time tutoring for the right thing. And then you back off and you're done, right? We took a unit assessment. 10 kids could take the same test and all get an 80 and they all missed different 20% in that exam. Right. So how much more effective is it if we focused on the right 20% for that student? And then you backed away when they understood it, it just makes it so much easier. So I'd love to get it to a level of personalization where we're able to do that. So I'm, I'm going to bring a, sh a story for you. My son recently, and this is the last few years, you know, him, him and I joke around with AI. I've done a whole webinar series around this, how I taught him about generative AI. And I, and I told him about all the books. Imagine all the books that are out there that this robot has read and all the movies, it's already watched it and all the music, it's already heard it. And, and you could ask it any questions. And this is when he was six, he's 10 now. Okay, so four years ago, this is how I taught him. And he still has to read his books, right? I still make him read it. But for me, I... I I'll be the first to raise my hand. I, I do do a cheat code. Uh, I do summarize how much he's read. And I I asked ChatGPT to tell me what questions should I ask it? And so ask my son to know that he's actually read these things. So I'm, I'm wondering, and all kidding aside, like where do you see education going? Like we have so much at our disposable now. And we have another team member who's getting her master's now and every week I keep on asking her, I'm like, so did you read the book or did you ask chat? Like, like, so I'm kind of curious on from your viewpoint, how do you see AI affecting education as a whole? And how are you guys making sure at least you're making people aware of all the different resources and tools that are out there? I mean, I think the simplest answer is imagine the internet and like what that did for education and multiply that by 10 if you want like some semblance of what it looks like. I think more broadly, you're already starting to see folks are dropping education requirements for jobs. Um, I actually think that's gonna have an, an inverse effect. I think people who have the credentials and the degrees are still going to stand out more because you've opened up 
an even larger pool and people need some system to filter by. I think the bachelor's degree is going to become like, I think the master's degree is going to become the new bachelor's degree. It's going to be a higher expectation. Whenever you have tools like this, you create more inequality. It's just people who jump on and there are people who get left behind for whatever reason. Um, and I don't think it's going to just be income driven um, because I think everyone has that same level of access. And it's why we have stories all the time of folks coming from developing countries, using the internet and being able to achieve um, incredible educations. AI is going to only amplify that and create that same opportunity for more children. I think for us, we're using it in our technology when we're building it, we're talking about it with our educators, we're, we're using it as a product internally within our own organization, within our company. Um, and I love the quote that says like, no one's gonna be replaced by AI, but you're gonna be replaced by people using AI. Um, and I think it'll be a lot like that, that calculator scenario, right? You, you're not gonna hire somebody who's just sitting there manually doing multiplication anymore. Like take the calculator out. So use the AI. We're gonna be able to do more sophisticated things as a result of it, but we all need to be users of it. I always tell people, education is not what you tell people, it's what you show them. Right. So people don't do what, what you tell them, they do what you do. And so oftentimes we forget that the most powerful teaching tool is the way we, that we live and the way that we operate. There's, there's another thing, Kareem, that my team drew up here on you and it just blew me away is, okay, you started an incredible business you scaled it, you still have a lot to go. If that wasn't enough, <laughs> you're, you're, you've been an inspirational speaker on TED. If that wasn't enough, somehow magically you still found to write a book, not one, but two. How the heck are you doing all of this? Like, how, how are you even managing your day and your time and, and, and What's the trick? Can you give us a little productivity hack for us to understand how we can prioritize the way you are and be able to accomplish so much? I mean, it, it's the, the clarity that I had around my purpose, just getting that really early on. Um, then the other two, I'd say, are they're more mainstream. Like there's prioritization techniques, right, where you're doing the important and urgent, the urgent but not important, the important and not urgent. And you, you prioritize daily, I say. And then the last one is habit stacking. Um, there's a lot of really good habits. That, and I, you know, I built good habits from 18 to 22. Typically, they say, like, build good life habits in your 20s. I didn't know what those good habits were before that. So I didn't build them before that, right? But getting your eight hours of sleep, making sure you're working out, going to bed early so you can get up early because all the productivity is in the morning and a lot of the wasted time is in the evening. Um, being really clear about what you're working towards. I mean, just those little things have made a world of a difference. And then, you know, I think long-term. So you, you take small bits every single day and they do, they add up pretty quickly, but just making sure you're doing something towards it. Kareem, thank you so much. If anyone in the listening audience wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way that they can contact you? Just go to my website, kareemabulnaga.com. You can submit a message there. I'm also all over social media. So LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, reach out. Happy to connect. Thank you again, Kareem, for sharing your remarkable journey and insights with us today. Your passion for education and mission to close the opportunity gap are incredible. We look forward to seeing what you and practice will achieve in the next five years. Hopefully the five-year timeline becomes even faster and it's done in <laughs> two years or so. Uh, to our listeners, we hope you found the conversation as enlightening as we have. Kareem's story is a powerful reminder of dedication and vision's impact on business and creating lasting social change. Thank you for listening. Subscribe uh, to our podcast and enjoyed you. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the conversation. <laughs>